Governor, if I might, all your discussion about reconfiguring the health care system uh, raises the question of where are we in terms of the hospital merger, Lifespan and uh, Care New England? Are you in these talks? Where are these talks? Is that a part of this reconfiguration that you've discussed? Excellent question. So. Um, I am supporting their efforts. I am not, when you say am I in them, you may recall last summer I, I led an effort to convene the leaders of those two systems uh, in order to try to drive us towards an integrated academic medical center. Unfortunately, that didn't work out at the time. This effort is being led by them. So the hospital administrators called me a couple of days ago to advise me that they were doing this. But I have to give them a lot of credit. This is being driven by them. They're working together. And I have said to them, let me know how I can support the effort. But it's really being driven by the leaders. It is, look, there's a lot of unknowns. So we have to figure out how will it be done, et cetera. But the concept is very consistent with what I'm laying out here. Better integration, better communication, less fragmentation, investments in community care, uh, and I and I will add uh, a commitment to the workforce. I think that's very important. Well, how do you envision all of that coming together? I'm sorry. How do you envision all of that coming together? All of that. I think there are different ways that you know they've just started. They're giving themselves, I think, 90 days to figure out the details. Oh, I mean, reworking the healthcare system in the state. I mean, I'm what, sorry. What okay. Is it, yeah. What is it? you're looking for? What's the aim here? Yeah, so some of it's what I announced today, you know, investments in primary care, investments in health equity zones, investments in pediatricians, uh, investments in, in uh, frontline employees. The vision that I have that we need to move towards is tilting the system away from the most expensive institutional settings towards uh, you know, home care and primary care towards preventative efforts and really uh, towards health, you know, a focus on health and equity, which means a lot of this has to happen in a community. So what we've seen is we've learned a lot in this crisis. You know, we've learned that there are inherent struggles with infection control in nursing homes. We've learned that we need to do more to shore up our home health care system. We've learned that hospitals are fragile. Our hospital systems are fragile. And we're going to be there for them. And thank God we got the money from Congress to, as I said, this $150 million. But if they come together and have an integrated system, they'll be stronger um, both financially and also in delivering care. Just the salary boost you talked about for <coughs> Uh, hospital or healthcare workers who are paid under $20. How much does that cost to date? How much do you anticipate it's going to cost in the future? Can you help me? It's, uh, we've spent, for the first month, we spent uh, $8.7 million and then we're budgeting up to $5 million for the final two weeks. But we won't, it's an application process, so that's an estimate based upon usage. Governor, you mentioned you've learned a lot about especially infection control in nursing homes, and I think it was yesterday when you, yesterday or the day before when you talked about nursing homes um, and, and letting patients leave the hospital with COVID to go to nursing homes, and, and maybe that wasn't the best idea. But at the same time, you cut off visitation. So uh, how do those two things kind of square with each other? If you knew it was a problem to let people into nursing homes, but also let people in from the hospitals, and what was the thinking at Well, this now we've stopped both. So, what, you, you know, what I said was that, in the, like, in the very early days, we did, you know, folks were released who were COVID positive to various nursing homes, and now we're not doing that. Now we're, co we're putting people together. We have these COVID positive homes. I guess what I'm getting at is, was that at, still after the visitation was stopped? Were people being allowed to leave hospitals while they were COVID patient positive after I visitation think was stopped? Not. Okay. No, I think not. You're, now you're like testing my memory, but the, that these releases were uh, like in the first few days or week that we were getting ourselves organized, 
and then very quickly we shut down that practice and shut down visitation. And still, as you know, shutting down visitation and shutting down that practice. Also, at that time, we, had, we, we weren't even testing people. So, you know, it, we've learned a lot, but like, so now we are just through our third pass of testing, uh, offering testing to every employee of every nursing home. And we have these point of care tests, we're doing the mobile testing in nursing homes. So we're just a lot better at it than we were. On nursing homes, um, I think yesterday your answer to Brian's question about you know, Massachusetts is allowing some people to visit their loved ones in nursing homes again. You doubled down on your decision not to do that. I think some folks are frustrated. Yeah. Can you just shine some light on the metrics that you guys are looking at to determine when you will allow that to happen again? I know you mentioned yesterday potentially during phase three. Yeah. I'm going to let the doctor answer this. I should say that our decision on that has been completely led. I have deferred completely to the Department of Health, so I'm going to let him answer that. Obviously, it bothers us a lot that people can't go visit folks in the nursing home. I just want to get that out. It bothers me. Um, we feel very bad about this. To, what we're looking for is this, and if this guidance should be released today, is every nursing home to actually develop a plan in assisted living for how they're going to accept visitors. I just want to emphasize the risk. And, and part of why we just need to get this out in the open is 80% of our deaths are folks older than 60 years old. Very vulnerable population for folks living in nursing homes. Part of that too is just that, you know, our, our, a lot of our folks who are older can do fine with home health care workers. We have a great home health care system um, in Rhode Island, so we should be very thankful for that. They do really good work. So when we get though to this, it's a very vulnerable population. So what nursing homes need to do is look at what they have as their nursing home and figure out for them how they can interpret our guidance connected to the CMS guidance. CMS is Center for Medicaid Medicare Services, connected to that guidance as to what makes sense for that nursing home. Some nursing homes are going to be different places than others are. Others will be like, you know what, we can figure out a way to do this in phase three, we'll be okay. To Some are going to be like, you know, we're not so sure we're ready. And, and part of what I'm getting into is it's not like one nursing home is just like the other ones. They're different and you have to look at the nooks and crannies of a nursing home to really see how does that nursing home interpret this. And it really gets to underscoring the concept, this virus is exquisitely transmissible. Um, you know, and, and I think it's just one of those things to really take home and just own as a concept is, the virus spreads so easily between person to person here. And if we could just hold on for a couple more weeks, my friends, I think we'll be in a much better place here. And I think that's just patience, it's hard. It's hard for me to be patient. Um, but patience is action. And, and we're looking for the long haul here. This is a marathon. We are day 96 since patient number one in Rhode Island. Day 158 is a planet. Um, there is much we have learned. In a few more weeks, I think we're going to be in a much safer place. And I would just ask us to hold on a little bit longer. And I know what I'm asking for people to do is hard. Um, it's hard for me. I'm as frustrated as you are because it's really hard not to connect with our elders. It's, not, it's so hard to connect with our, our spouses. They, I've heard so many stories from people saying, I really want to get back in there, and I get it. I really do. Doctor, as long as you're at the podium, um, the National Counterintelligence and Security Center, which is part of the uh, Office of the Director of National Intelligence, issued an advisory uh, expressing some concerns that a number of the commercial laboratories that are handling testing um, are co-owned or otherwise responsible for things like maintaining a genetic database in China. And they've warned that this may concern people. Um, do you have any knowledge of any connections, or is are these being used in Rhode Island? Are those the commercial labs that are doing work in Rhode Island? And what safeguards are there to prevent uh, compromise of personal health information, including genetic material? So the first I'm hearing about your question is right now, and first I'm hearing about that as an issue is right now. So what I will just say is, I will look into it. The other thing I'll just say is I expect every health care provider, every health care laboratory to follow federal and state law when it comes to protected health information. The other concept though is, and I think you brought up a really interesting concept about genetic material. 
uh, that's important, and that's private too. So we just can't willy-nilly throw things around here. Um, but y your genetic material is, is yours as well. That can't be released without your consent. So thanks for raising the issue. I'll look into it. Dr. McDonald, while you're up there, <clears throat> could you just clarify exactly the distancings in the mask? I just came from a press conference at the State House, and we had state elected leaders shoulder to shoulder and, and I said, you're supposed to be spaced out, standing there for an over an hour, over in 15 minutes. And one of them, I don't know who, said, oh no, we're outside, we have masks on. But could you clarify for people, I, I was still under the impression, I think a lot of people, it, it's not like passing in a store. You should still be distanced when you're standing for a period of time. Yeah, so exactly right. Um, I don't care if you're outside or inside. I, I, you need to be six feet apart. Dr. Chan was just talking on a CME we were doing yesterday for the healthcare providers in the state about a recent study that showed if you're within one meter of somebody, um, much higher risk than if you're two meters out. So it's really, it's really important not to be near each other. And, and by the way, I get how unnatural that is, by the way. Like, we've grown up as a culture walking side by side each other. When we go to meetings, we think it's polite now to be next to each other. I know that's what we're used to, but what we're used to could be life-threatening to us. And so it's really important. We've done this before. Double arms length away. I'm five foot four. I'm not quite, but that's, you know what I'm saying, my folks? What I'm saying is you've got to be at least six feet away from each other. And, you know, one of the things I think is important, too, is, like, I, I love the way you're asking it. You're so gentle and respectful. But sometimes I think we just be really gentle and respectful to our peers who aren't doing these things. It, it's what, I mean, I'm in Home Depot shopping for... My little guy wants to put a garden in, right? So put it in the garden, right? And I'm trying to get a little watermelon plant. Someone comes right next to me. I just pulled back... If you need that watermelon plant more than I do, God bless you. Go enjoy it, right? But I'm pulling back. Same with my little guy. We're just staying six feet away. I'm role modeling in a polite way. I'm not judging others. I'm not yelling at people, nor am I encouraging anyone to. And I think it's just important to be really kind to each other. We're all learning these new skills. And when you see people... I'm doing this. I was invited to a public gathering. Um, there was media there. People weren't six feet apart. Someone's talking. I just stopped the person and said, we're going to be six feet apart. This is what we're going to do. And everybody was like, oh, good, the doctor said that. And it made people feel better, right? And I guess what I'm saying to you is, is if you could just remind people, the reason why I want you six feet apart from each other is it's just safer for you. And I think it's just important. Like I was hiking over the weekend down at Chafee Park in North Kingstown. I had a great time. I didn't see everybody being six feet apart. I'm not the six feet police, though, right? I didn't say anything to folks. What I did was I role modeled with my family. We were six feet apart from each other. And that's we're wearing our masks, too, by the way, uh, because I just think it's important, right? So thanks for asking. And by the way, I, you know, whatever you do in this world, the reason I want you six feet apart is when you're closer than six feet away, when you exhale, you might be asymptomatically throwing out this virus, which, you know, I've told you it's a thief. I don't like the virus. I respect it, but I don't like it. it you could be infecting someone else and we have to be other oriented it's part of just recognizing the value of each other Doctor, thank you follow up on your family you shared with us a week or two a, a very nice story about your daughter and, and how she's I'm just curious how does your family react when you share a story like that um, what, any feedback on that how did Sarah like her story you kidding me she loved it uh, if, if Sarah, if she could be an actress, she would be. Like, she was going to be in Dolly, right? So she loved the story, and she's thrilled I did it. And you know what blew her away even more was Ed Fitzpatrick from the Boston Globe put it in the Boston... It's the Boston Globe, right? And she's reading about herself, and I said... I mean, I remember saw in the article Friday morning, I said, sweetie, you made the big time. Congratulations, you know? And But you ask how my family interacts with this, and it's like, you know... Um, I think they recognize daddy's not home as much as he used to be, and when he's home, he's not home. And one of the things that I'm learning about this is how to be with my kids more when I'm home. And one of the things I'm noticing, too, though, is I'm missing certain things in life. And one of the things I just, part of why I keep saying the virus is a thief is it's stealing a little bit more of my joy than it used to. My kids have these great events in life, and I can't share with them. And so, like, this Friday night, we're going to go see Sarah graduate from high school. And I'm excited about that. We're going to do it from a car, and that's fine. And that's the way it should be done. School's doing a very responsible job at that. Um, but I think it underscores how our lives are different. They're just not going to be different forever. Um, it's going to get better someday. We're going to be in a happier place, and it's going to be okay. Governor, 
kind of playing off Dr. McDonald and the, the school theme, I know it's still a few months away. As things stand right now, what is your thinking on schools? Would it be possible even to send kids back to school in some fashion, or do you think that's out of the question if there's no vaccine? Mm, good question. Um, yes, it would be possible. And next week, I'm going to lay out some plans around school. That is, um, we got a bunch of news next week. We're going to put it into Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and school is on the docket. Uh, I want to open school. Kids deserve school. So we're working really hard, and if you just give me another week, I'll come back to you with the details. But the short answer to your question is yes. Is, po is it possible? I think it is. I know this has been floated out there, too, kind of like a hype. You know, the some at home. Is that really a possibility, and how does that work with people's child care? It's like, how do you tell people exactly. your kids? Exactly. So this is why I need a little more time, and actually we're going to be working throughout the summer to figure it out. I think there are certain things we do know, like when I was saying earlier about telehealth, telemedicine, that's working well. We've learned that innovation, we should make it permanent. You know, we should pass a law and make it permanent. Well, the same is true with distance learning. It is. I'm not suggesting we want to be permanently and forever exclusively distance learning, but we know that kids can't be going to school when they're sick. So we're going to, but the good news is, we're going to be very strict about not letting kids come to school when they're sick so they can work at home and do distance learning. You know, maybe it's the end of the snow day, <laughs> right? Like forever, kids have. <laughs> Kids, that's the news, right? Like, kids forever have missed school for school days. Well, they've been distance learning for two months. Why don't we just pop to distance learning? So um, it is my strong desire to get these kids back to school. Obviously, we have to do it safely and responsibly and with great detail. And I'm going to dedicate a, one of these next week to do that. Um, right now, we're still talking to teachers, superintendents, parents, principals, etc. Um, but yes, I do think it is possible. Well, Governor, I think that I think that maybe this will be the end of the snow day is going to be the headline in every article. I know. Yeah. Um, is there any formal assessment that you're making? on how well distance learning is going. I know you're getting informal reports. Yes, actually, uh, the Department of Education is making uh, pretty detailed formal assessments right now uh, as the school is still a couple weeks left of school. Just around, yes, the short answer is yes. You know, attendance, grades, curriculum, uh, they're really digging into it. I would say that in general, we've been pleasantly surprised. I don't think we knew what to expect when we went into this. I think it's fair to say it's gotten harder the longer it's gone on. But it, by every account, it's been certainly exceeded my expectations. Do you think we are done with the National Guard and with the uh, curfews and so forth? I do not. I do not. Where do we stand with this? Y you mean with the civil unrest? Correct. Yeah. <laughs> I have to get my crises, correct. Um, so the president has just said yesterday that we can use and be federally reimbursed for the National Guard until August 21st. That is very welcome news. Right now we have over a thousand Guard deployed in these dual missions. We definitely still need the Guard for contact tracing, testing, quarantining, etc. Uh, the Guard is, is still heavily deployed as we meet the potential security threats. They are today, they will be tomorrow, they will be through the weekend, and I don't know. The answer, Steve, is I'll need to keep them there until I feel it's safe, and I don't know when that's going to be. Will you have troops at what is expected to be or planned to be a peaceful rally tomorrow? Or We're trying to, cert yes, there will certainly be security, and I'll have I'm happy to talk to you more about that. I'm getting, that's how I'm spending the afternoon, getting fully briefed, but we're working around the clock to, with local law enforcement, the Guard, and the State Police. There are, uh, last night, by the way, there was a very peaceful and wonderful protest in Woonsocket. Great. There are, I think, three or four peaceful protests planned tomorrow and Saturday in Providence and in Bristol. We're going to do everything we can to be absolutely supportive of that. Department of Health will be there passing out masks. Um, in the evenings, we're going to be very vigilant. We are going to do everything we need to do, 24-hour surveillance, to be very vigilant. I'm
just going to ask about some of the frustration that we're hearing from our viewers, our readers, our listeners who are watching these protests happening, large gatherings, who are saying to us, well, then why can't I have a traditional graduation or a backyard barbecue or a wedding? What is your message to those people? Yeah. Uh, I get it. I hear that. I do hear it. Um, as I've said all along, my job is to tell you what you should do to stay safe. Right now, the social gathering limit is 15. So Brian asked me the other day, were you at the protest? I was not. I support it 100%. Social gathering limit is 15. Mask wearing outside. So um, what I can tell you is like what the doctor just said. If you want to have a graduation, the safe, responsible way to do it right now is in your car. Um, as I said yesterday, if you're going to participate in one of these protests and you have a vulnerable loved one at home, man, you better think twice before you do that. And uh, look, at I think this is an unprecedented moment in America, what we are seeing. People are going to protest. I support their rights, and I'm just asking them to be socially distanced, wear their masks, and do the best. My whole approach from day one in this is to encourage voluntary compliance. So there's been protests throughout this. We have not been heavy-handed in our enforcement. We're not going to start that now. I'm encouraging voluntary compliance. I understand um, from some eagle-eyed viewers that the mask executive order was set to expire today, I believe. I renewed it. You I signed it last night to renew it. Until then. For another month. Thank you. For another month. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I'm glad someone's reading all the fine print of these executive orders. All right. Thank you.